the oral history criminology pro the oral history criminology project in conjunction with the American Society of Criminology is pleased to present the conversation with Charles Tittle. We come to you in June 2012 from his office here at NC State where you have uh, retained the title of professor since the year of 2000. Uh, also, for purposes of the record here, it should be noted that, uh, well, looking across the wall here, and there's your Southern Award that you earned in uh, 1998. Um, um, You've um, been recognized as an ASC Fellow, and you also, importantly, served as a criminology editor, our flagship journal, um, from 92 to 97. So we hope to cover a lot of this within the context of uh, our discussion about sort of the life and times of Charles Tittle. Um, but before you became the, the world famous criminologist that you are, uh, you were just uh, an undergraduate that, uh, correct me, I got, what's the name of your undergraduate? O Ochita? No, it's Washita. <laughs> Washita, uh, in Arkadelphia, Arkansas. So how does a guy from Arca how does a guy who goes to this, this small Baptist college in Arkadelphia ultimately end up as a criminologist? What drew you into the field? Um, well, I didn't. I didn't start off uh, with any interest whatsoever in criminology. Uh, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I didn't study it as an undergraduate, and I didn't plan to study it as a grad student. Yeah. Um, uh, at the uh, at the small Baptist college, I was a history major, and uh, part of our requirements as a history major, we had to take two sociology courses. I never heard of sociology either. But but I went to take the two sociology courses and became quite, uh, quite intrigued and then uh, ended up as a double major. And um, uh, various professors, both historians and uh, sociologists, of course, in a small college, you don't have that many. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you might have three history professors and you might have one sociology professor. That's yeah. exactly the case. But anyway, uh, they all sort of suggested that grad school would be a good, good school idea. Uh, and um, what, what kinds of things were they introducing you to in terms of? I mean, these are are these like large survey courses, and there's a criminological element that you thought was. Oh well, it really didn't have anything to do with criminology. No. In in the history uh, department, uh, uh, I was interested in intellectual history actually. Oh, all right. And <laughs> that's uh, pretty cool. And then uh, in uh, sociology, uh, just general sociology and. Uh, it was suggested that I might want to go to might want to go to grad school, but I, like many undergrads, I had no notion that they'll actually pay you to do that. <laughs> I thought I thought oh, I never couldn't afford how would I, how would I afford that. Yeah. I, barely, I barely you know work in weekends and yeah. uh, part time jobs all summer. And, uh, I managed to get through college, but I thought, my God, how would I ever get through grad school? And then finally, somebody clued me in and said, well. There's there's financial support for that. Yeah. In fact, you can apply for it before you ever go to grad school, and I did. I applied for a Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship okay. and a Danforth National Fellowship, um, and actually got got both of them. <laughs> and, uh, so I was able to basically uh, pick uh, whatever grad school I want to go to, okay. and. Uh, uh, be largely paid for by okay. these uh, by these national fellowship programs, but I didn't know anything about grad programs yeah. except what I've been told. And my teachers, both in um, the history department and my sociology teacher, mm -hmm. were both graduates of the University of Texas oh, at Austin. Okay. And uh, the the guy in history was a student of the famous historian uh, uh, W. P. Webb, okay. who uh, uh, argued for the influence of technology in the development of the American West and argued that the thing that uh, transformed the American West made it possible so on with park wire and uh, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. So anyway, uh, so as far as I knew, there's only one graduate school in the world, <laughs> <laughs> the University of Texas Austin. So yeah. I applied and uh, of course they were glad to get a student who com comes with funding <laughs> yeah. so they don't have to do it. Yeah. Uh, and when I got there, that's when I met Jack okay. uh, Gibbs, and um, uh, he was at that time uh, transposing from an interest in uh, uh, human ecology, mm -hmm. which is uh, largely urban sociology, yeah. uh, to uh, uh, 
social control. Okay. And he ended up, of course, writing uh, four books on on control or social control or whatever. Was this the deterrence thing that's well? Deterrence was part of it, but yeah, uh, he has one book on uh, conceptualization of social control. Like Gibbs always does, he. He classifies everything in <laughs> minute, yes. minute detail, yeah. and yeah. Uh, nobody, of course, is interested in reading it because he bores you to death with it. But yeah. it it includes every possible detail, uh, and yeah. uh, so he was transitioning into social control, and uh, I I, uh, I had him during that transition period, and he was um, uh, talking about stuff that uh, I had. As an undergraduate in a small religious school, it's come to believe it was just just wrong. Yeah. Uh, because uh, I was taught that uh, human values were the key both to human behavior and to quote the good society. Okay. And uh, Gibbs's position was uh, human values don't matter. Huh. At all, yeah. Um, structural things matter, huh. and uh, social control matters. Yeah, that is, people do what they do because they're main, they're, they're forced to by either circumstances or fear of punishment or yeah. or some such thing like that. And human values is just uh, that's that stuff that people tell themselves huh. are important. Those are the justifications that they give to themselves. Okay. Well, this, of course, was uh, contrary to everything that I had grown up believing. Yeah. And so um, I engaged in a uh, sort of a, a conflict with, with Jack. <laughs> um, not too openly, because uh, I would lose for sure yeah. if I were to be in a conflict. But yeah. it, the conflict was uh, went on for for many years in my own mind in my own work in which I was trying to to uh, find out if uh, he was right yeah uh, and um, so I got into the whole question of uh, social control and deterrence yeah. and all that kind of stuff and uh, eventually came full circle now I'm back to the moral issues oh. and uh, so um, I have a uh, an interesting line of work going with one of my former grad students up at the University of Nebraska. Uh, he's got, uh, over at the University of Nebraska, they have a a, a lab over there for studying uh, human brains. Yeah. And the way they got the money for it was to uh, convince the uh, funders, people at the legislature and, and yeah. so on and so forth, that this brain lab would be used for uh, other things than um, uh, medical stuff. Okay. And so one of the things I want to do is to bring social science into using the brain lab somehow. Well, most social science first don't know how to operate equipment, and you don't know how to interpret yeah. uh, uh, what those uh, yeah. things tell you anyway. So they sent out a notice uh, inviting people to come for a training course in um, in the use of uh, the. Uh, Huh. Equipment in the brain lab. Yeah. So, John uh, conferred with me about it. And I said, "Yeah, go do it and see what's going on." So he goes and takes a training course, and became became very very excited. And um, um, if you were at the last ASC yeah. meeting, I don't know if you went to that big session where uh, uh, Mike Godfordson and uh, Marcus Felson and uh, Rob Sampson gave a talk and I was discussing mm -hmm. and uh, the main themes that uh, Godverson was making and felt some lesser so for Samson but the main themes that Godverson and uh, Felson were making was exactly that old argument that Gibbs made huh. which was uh, morality is irrelevant morality is uh, what people tell themselves to justify what they do, that there is no such thing as a a moral force that influences human behavior or human society. Uh, and in my uh, discussion, uh, I raised the possibility that uh, 
uh, we don't know whether it is or not because we don't have very much good research about okay. it. Okay. Among other things, the work, the research that we do about morality is based on sort of simplistic survey relevant measurements where you ask people, okay, what do you think is right or wrong? And we find that those are very highly predictive things, but uh, why is it highly predictive? And the critics say it's highly predictive because people figure out what they want to do and then they turn around and give you the moral yeah. the, the morality okay. question. Yeah. So uh, John and I said, well, if we're ever going to make any progress in understanding uh, the extent to which morality matters or doesn't matter, we've got to have uh, measures that are more compelling All right. than what we've got right now. And so we're working up um, a series of studies where we are, we're going to uh, uh, develop our survey measures and then we're going to try them out on people who are hooked up with, uh, with the right. brain stuff. Okay. And there's already a big body of literature among these brain researchers about which part of the brain uh, controls cognitive functions yeah. and which part of the brain controls moral function and all this kind of stuff. So uh, we want to be able to validate yeah. our survey measures with with these machines. Okay. And uh, once we've formulated questions that cause the portions of the brain that are known to deal with morality yeah. to, to light up, yeah. uh, then we'll put those on our surveys and, then we'll, uh, and so on. So. Uh, that's kind of an exciting thing yeah. that, I'm, that I'm doing right now. Uh, we've been slowed down a little bit because uh, John needs to um, do a little more training on the uh, on the use of machines over there. But okay. they, they won't do a training session unless they get uh, uh, six people, huh. and uh, he can't find enough other people on the campus who are interested in yeah. spending. Uh, Two weeks or whatever it is, learning to use this. So. so, do you think do you think that's where criminology is heading these days in terms of? Uh, no, I don't think we're headed that way. I think no. that the the uh, influence of um, biology and genetics yeah. and all that is making inroads. Okay. But uh, we're not we're not anywhere close to that becoming a, a dominant paradigm, huh. in my opinion. What 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 might impede that or? Uh, uh, well, uh, we uh, I, I, it, there's just a lot of skepticism. Um, uh, cr criminologists are, are have a very strong historical connection with sociology. Yes, yes. Sociologists have always been um, convinced that uh, those things don't matter. Yeah. That uh, genetics doesn't matter and. Uh, Brain operation, all none of that matters. Yeah. Uh, because uh, social processes, social influence, yeah. so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, not only are they convinced of that, but they're not as convinced of it as they think they are. Okay. Because if they yeah. were as convinced of it, then they wouldn't oppose research. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, testing the uh, genetic component and all that. But uh, a lot of times they do. And I, I, it's even happened in my own department here where we recently had an episode where we, we interviewed a young fellow for a job and uh, a certain proportion of our faculty um, opposed his uh, hiring uh, uh, on the grounds that uh, he must be a racist because he uh, brought into his research uh, some genetic markers, huh. not of race, but yeah. genetic markers for illness, because he was studying um, uh, access to, to health okay. uh, facilities and who gets sick and who doesn't, and okay. how social class and other kinds of things influence that. And uh, in his research, he had some genetic markers that would uh, uh, suggest that some people are likely to get or diabetes for okay. example, uh, heart condition, all these things we know have some yeah. some uh, uh, family genetic roots and so on. Anyway, 
Um, so there's still this age-old sort of antipathy toward yeah, the suspicion yeah. he, of, he, he must, of anybody's anybody's doing that must be they must be uh, you know scratch the surface and you'll find a racist okay. of some kind. All right. And nothing sociologists hate worse than yeah than uh, uh, racism. And so the uh, but from my point of view, the, the best way to deal with things like that is to. Confront it, get the evidence, yeah. uh, judge it scientifically, yeah. and uh, if it tells you one thing that confirms your belief, great. If it challenges those beliefs, yeah. then the idea is to figure out uh, how it all fit together. Now, this relates to something that you've been uh, uh, dealt with publicly in terms of the application of knowledge and yeah. what do we do when we find these things yeah. and. Yep. It, you talk to us a little bit about your critique of public sociology and, and those kinds of efforts to yeah. uh, in terms of what do you see that right. science is what's right. science's role versus right right well um, like like every other concerned citizen I would like to have uh, knowledge based policy yeah however we don't have a knowledge base good enough to make policy on yeah. that's my position. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, I, if, at least my perceptual account is that we, I, it, I keep, that notion keeps getting reaffirmed, reaffirmed for me because things come up all the time in which um, we said we knew, yeah. but we didn't know. Okay. And when somebody took us seriously, it, it turned out to be a disaster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, um, I just uh, it it uh, it worries me that so many people out there are so eager mm -hmm. to be influenced by policy. They they want to do that, yeah, and they want to do it on the basis of a study okay. or a couple of studies yeah. or some such thing like that. And uh, I think that's just totally contrary to science that uh, yeah. one study doesn't make a science. In fact, a whole bunch of studies uh, might not make a science. Uh -huh. um, and science is a sort of a slow uh, grinding process yeah. that uh, has to be theoretically driven and so on. And then the end product of that is uh, better, better, more firmly established empirical knowledge. Uh -huh. um, but, uh, uh, People are very impatient. People want to yeah. go out and make policy on the basis, really, of what they believe, yeah. not what they know. Uh, now, does that present a particularly uh, compelling problem for criminology, just because it has been uh, expressly oriented toward formulating a better, more humane criminal justice system? Um, it's almost it rooted in its DNA. It, well, it. It's a problem for sociology too. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, and before it was a problem for criminology, it was a problem for sociology. Yeah. Uh, and um, probably uh, a problem for economics as well. Oh, yeah. And certainly right. a possible problem for psychology. Um, but um, dis despite my critique, mm -hmm. which uh, it didn't make much difference. Uh, the trend, I think, in modern criminology is toward a policy learning type work. Yeah. Um, the journals have become uh, very, very dominated almost. Yeah. In the last, for the last two editors of criminology, I don't know how it's going to turn out with uh, Osgood. Okay. But uh, certainly the, the previous two, uh, Denise Gofferson. Um, and I'm not counting Ray because he didn't finish his time, right. but I'm, yeah. uh, I'm counting uh, 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 different ones, but, but Denise in particular. Okay. Uh, anyway, if you pick up criminology these days, pick up the last issue. Yeah. You know, almost everything is a is, is has a policy orientation okay. of some kind. All right. Uh, and often, small, tiny, little. Little little issues uh, uh, that uh, um, they're sort of they're sort of general. I mean, 
they're, they're designed to be useful for making policy. Okay. But the people who make policy don't care. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. That's just fundamental disjunct there. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so we, yeah. the more we build uh, our business around these kinds of things, the more we have these little random pieces of knowledge that uh, policymakers are not going to put together. Okay. And we can't put it together because we're not driven by yeah. uh, common theoretical themes. Uh, okay. Uh, I see the problem here. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I re uh, last fall I went to give one of those lectures at uh, Sam Houston State. Um, they have this lecture the series. The Beto? The Beto oh, lecture wow. series. Congratulations. Congratulations. Oh, well, uh, what I'm probably the last guy in the, in the series that's been doing this for all these years. Yeah. And finally they ran out of good coffee. <laughs> <laughs> they finally Poor ran culture. out of silly. <laughs> anyway, I went over there and um, I, uh, you meet a lot of new, new grad students and find out what they're doing and so on. And clearly what they're doing over there is there's these policy or yep. orientations. Yeah. And. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm, I met a number of students. In fact, I'm, I'm still working with uh, one of the students I met over yeah. there, a Turkish fellow. We're going to do a survey in Turkey. <laughs> oh, my <gosh. laughs> And, and uh, a couple of faculty members are working on control balancing. And just, but anyway, um, one of the, this uh, Turkish fellow that I, I met, uh, I said, well, what, you know, what are you doing? And, uh, he said, well, I'm, I'm studying uh, police response time. And I said, well, uh, why? All right. Yeah. He didn't have an answer. It's like, well, I, I want to get a PhD. Yeah. And I have to do a dissertation. Yeah. And here's one to do. Okay. And uh, I said, well, t what about police response time? What are you doing? Are you comparing? Cities yeah. in Texas, what are you doing? Okay. I said, no, I'm just looking at the response time in Houston. I said, um, and um, what do you yeah. hope to learn? Well, he didn't, he didn't know what he hoped to learn other than how to improve it. All right. And um, it may be perfectly good yeah. work from a technical point of view. Yeah. Uh, but I have to wonder, in the larger enterprise yeah. here, is that really good usage of his time and effort and brain power and so on? How, how much of criminology do you think is driven by that? Just the methods there, the data's well, there? A whole but, bunch of it, uh, yeah. and getting more so, I think. Is that is that good or bad? or? Uh, well, I, I don't think it's going to lead us where we want to go. But, yeah. So I, I wouldn't want to use the word bad or good in that yeah. sense, but I, I just don't think it'll be profitable for okay. us to get to where we can go. Of course, we don't agree about where we want to go, and that's that's also an issue. Yeah. From, from my point of view, we ought to, we ought to be building a, a, an integrated body of knowledge, okay. which is driven by general theories that uh, allow us to integrate our knowledge into okay. explanatory systems and then once those general theories are are built and verified and so on mm -hmm. then you can uh, draw from them explanations of all kinds of things okay and um, you can uh, th then you can talk about policy making because you put draw on a general body of theory. okay um, but these kinds of studies very hard to figure out how they're going to um, yeah. contribute to that enterprise. Okay. Uh, and like I say, they may be of interest to the police departments that are being studied. Police chief may say, oh, well, well great, I had this, I can implement some of these things and uh, speed up the response time for a burglary call from yeah. 14 and a half minutes to 13 and a half minutes okay. and maybe improve the arrest rate or whatever. Okay. Uh, but in Beyond that, what does it do? Yeah. Okay. Uh, why do you do it? Uh, what's the point? Uh, and uh, so, so many of the, the, so much of the stuff that goes on at the, in the journals, or yeah. our disciplinary journals these days, and at the meetings. Yeah. Golly, 
uh, out of all the sessions we have, what do we have now? 800 and some sessions. Yeah. About yeah. 600 of them. Yeah. About 400, about police. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. Look at the line of support. Okay. And always the, uh, the police part is big, big, big yeah. stuff. And uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming that uh, this trend is going to become even more toward uh, the practical application. Okay. Because in the current criminologist, which just came a couple days ago, there's a piece by um, uh, uh, Todd Clear yeah. arguing for yeah. a merger of AFC and ACJS. Yeah. Um, and if if that would happen, were to happen, my guess is that uh, we would move more toward the uh, toward the practical okay. policy applied kind of. Okay. Um, well, when you're looking back at uh, all the things that you've done over the course of your career, you actually you've actually at certain points managed to to upset people. Yeah. At various points, you've been the one to raise those questions about, for instance, uh, uh, questioning the the correlation between socioeconomic status and, and delinquent uh, deviant kinds of outcomes. Uh, how has that served your career? I I don't know. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, been an advantage it, or a disadvantage. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's, um, p people know who I am. <laughs> yeah. So, so <laughs> that can be useful in a career. Yeah. yeah. But if they know who you are and they don't think too much of you, then yeah. that can be a disadvantage sure. for, for your career. Yeah. Um, so I, I, really, I don't know how to judge that. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm glad I had done those things yeah. because uh, uh, it uh, has um, it, it has caused people to uh, to try to uh, clarify and document okay. the things that they normally might take for granted without documentation. Okay. For for many many years, that's sort of what we did in sociology and criminology on the social class crime thing is. We just pass along one generation next this notion, without yeah. saying is this uh, is this established with the evidence and so on and so forth. Uh, now, um, uh, s some of the things people want to have more evidence about before they okay. they leap out to to do things. Okay, because guys are like you are sort of waiting in the wings to kind of question the evidence or yeah. you know, just yeah. hold them to account. Yeah, and, yeah. Well, I think that's right. Yeah. So how does criminology accumulate, how does it build its science then if it's constantly subjected to this sort of objections from time to time to time? Well, the, the objections are really a, a way of saying, uh, keeping people honest. Okay. It's a way of saying, All right. um, Let's have an open mind about this. Let's let's go look at the evidence. Same thing with the genetic things. Yeah. Um, I don't know uh, how much uh, effect uh, genetics has on criminal behavior. Yeah. Okay. But I don't want to rule out the possibility it has some. Okay. Because I think uh, so many of the modern innovations outside criminology, the the human genome and all the all of these kinds of things. Yeah. I don't want to be left out there in the cold. All right. If the world moves on, yeah, okay. with very compelling evidence that, that uh, shows that we're really stupid <laughs> not to have paid some attention to that. Okay. Uh, I want us to pay attention to it uh, with a with an open mind, but with a critical okay. stance. And if it turns out that the evidence supports. Uh, uh, certain kinds of ge genetic influences, then the next question is, uh, well, uh, how do the genetic things uh, interact with uh, very social things okay. uh, to, uh, to produce certain outcomes and so on? But if you rule out, you yeah. say, I'm not going to... That's off the table. I'm not going to allow myself to think about genetic yeah. influences. You're always... You never know. All right. You don't have any basis okay. for saying yeah. da 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 okay. because you've just not even paid any attention to this stuff over here. 
So, from my point of view, go Kevin Beaver. Go do your thing. Okay. And I want to see what you've got there. And uh, he now has a cadre of uh, yeah. students out there who are doing yeah. the same kind of thing. And uh, I think that's a that's a wonderful trend that, that that they can do that. Okay. That, All right. we, that we tolerate that at, okay. at, at the moment. Uh, and of course, as, as I told you earlier, I'm moving into sort yeah. of that part of that uh, zone okay. too. Yeah. Uh, and I would like to. Um, I'd like when John and I do these things with the brain research. Yeah. And the morality, I would like to be able to. Uh, send an article off to the journal without an honest reviewer saying we can't publish okay. policy, poli policy possibly consider this okay. because it is not what we do or we allow or, right. or we approve and so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, I want there to be that openness there for that as long as it's good work on scientific grounds. Okay. Uh, over the course of your career, you've, you've dabbled in a, a variety of different things as well. Like your early part of your career was uh, on uh, sort of correctional environments and things like that. Uh, do you see any commonality that, that may string all these things together? Is this all coherent in your mind, or, is, yeah, do, you, it, or do you get bored with one thing and you move to the next? And then, well, it, uh, how it, does this? It's, it, it's, uh, it, it appears incoherent, but yeah. un underlying all of it is uh, uh, always a question of. Uh, of uh, uh, the question of social order, how does okay. it, it happen and uh, how is it maintained and so on and so forth and how does it change and if, when you raise a question of change of course then uh, you, you get into the whole conflict uh, thing and so on but yeah. uh, uh, or even uh, when I was doing prison research the, the main thing that I was interested in is how, how is it in prison that they maintain order? Yeah. And some people say, well, that's just stupid because the guards have got guns and they, uh, they tell the inmates what to do. And yeah. That's that. Yeah. But it's not that way because <laughs> the inmates outnumber the guards yeah. many times yeah. over. Yeah. And if the inmates were organized in a mind to, they could crush the guards in a yeah, and, and nothing flat. So, order in prison really rests on something other than strict coercion. Yeah. Uh, and so when I when I went through grad school, it was Parsonian days. <laughs> and Parsons was all about uh, social integration and the, the yeah. role of uh, uh, moral morality and yeah. the of social integration and all that. So the prisons were sort of a challenge to that, and it made it interesting to me uh, to to sort of go with this eye like, well, Parsons has taught me that uh, social order rests on certain shared moral concerns, yeah. and the prison people tell me that uh, social order in the prison rests on guns and uh, force. Force, yeah. yeah. So what is what is the true story? And uh, I became convinced when I was uh, at the, the two institutions that I studied that neither one, neither one of them, which were were hardcore prisons, they were yeah. no drug drug things. But anyway, I became convinced that uh, the uh, the inmates and the prison officials actually do come to share moral moral. Yeah. Order. And uh, it, it, it's uh, uh, more so than you might imagine. Yeah. Uh, it's not the only thing, and of course, the, the, the moral order all by itself, without some force and coercion, probably won't yeah. won't stand either. So. Okay. Uh, but my work in prisons was to bring in the moral, okay. understanding the moral order. Uh, so, it, uh, but once I convinced myself, I didn't care anymore. So I didn't want to go back and spend a career being a penologist or something. Right. Yeah. So it didn't take long to 
sort of satisfy satisfy myself on that issue and uh, move on to some. No, a lot, are a lot of these themes oriented around your sort of internal uh, debate vis-a-vis -vis Jack Gibbs? Partly. Yeah. They were for years. I don't think they are now. But yeah. At first they were. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. without even knowing it, Jack sort of got under my skin, and yeah. into my head. Yeah. And um, I realized many years later that uh, I was thinking like Gibbs. What's <laughs> 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 happened here? <laughs> Now, when you look back at uh, the course of your career, are there any accomplishments, are there any landmarks, pieces of scholarship that you look back on and if somebody like me, 20 years from now, were teaching in a class, you would, you would be proud that I would be teaching this as, as something that you, had, that you had authored or crafted? Well, yeah, I, uh, I'm very proud of uh, the book on control balance, not for the theory yeah. of control balance, but because the purpose of the book was to tell people how to out of Bell General Theory okay. through integration, and uh, I'm convinced that uh, uh, that's a useful thing for us to do in our business. Now, do you think there was an undue emphasis on the the control balance rather than the the well, solid? Yeah, I think uh, the people who got interested in it got interested in the the example. Yeah, the control balance was an example. Yeah, to to uh, illustrate. The points and things that okay. the book was really about, yeah. and um, uh, the people who did get interested, and not that many people did, it's not yeah. that popular theory, but the ones who did get interested in, got interested in the theory, the example, the theory is an example, okay. and they forgot the lessons that that theory was supposed to illustrate. Yeah. Uh, so is that why you haven't made a more vociferous defense, yeah. a more invigorated defense of sure. this is control? Oh, sure, because sure. the point wasn't to Huh. Argue that control balance is, is it. Is it. All right. The point was, here's an example of okay. how to do these things I've been telling you how to do. Okay. Uh, I used to get annoyed at uh, reading of people who would uh, tell you how to do stuff, <laughs> but they wouldn't, yeah. they wouldn't show you how to do it. Okay. Uh, I had a big debate with one of my former colleagues at Washington State, a guy named Lee Fries, who... Um, wrote a very wonderful article in ASR about uh, formal formal theory. Okay. And, and, uh, oh, that's all Jack, the yeah, Jack Gibbs yeah, inspired stuff. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Shocked. Anyway, um, it, was, it was a magnificent article, and so when I went to Washington State, I sat out with Lee, and I said, uh, gee, this is just a really wonderful argument, but yeah. uh, nobody knows how to do it, <laughs> and what you need to do is to show us how to do it. Okay. Illustrate it. He said, oh, I can't do that. I don't want to do that. Yeah. It's like, well, I mean, if you advocating for it, if you <laughs> won't show people how to do it, yeah. how do you ever expect anybody to do it? Okay. And, uh, anyway, uh, picking up where we sort of left off there in terms of uh, the status of uh, control balance theory and what it was designed to do is sort of an illustrative uh, point there. Um, how do you think that, uh, how are you satisfied with the field's reaction to it? Um, I, I, I would still like to see a good test. I don't think anybody's okay. done a good test. Yeah. Even though the uh, point was not to promote control balance theory, but okay. to promote a style of theorizing. Uh, still, I'd kind of like to know if uh, yeah, what the evidence shows about that. And every test so far, I think is. Uh, kind of off base, okay. and uh, so we really don't have any evidence, but uh, yeah, I, good evidence yeah. I'm talking about. So I'd like to see um, some some good evidence about it. My own grad students, uh, on their own, uh, collected some data and did what they thought was going to be a test control balance, and they did it wrong. Okay. They didn't even confer with me ahead of time. But has it been fruitful in terms of introducing that one of the one of the parts that I really enjoy about the work is the first couple chapters are where you lay out the tenets of these are the things these are the criteria that we ought to yeah. be yeah. aiming our efforts toward. Yeah. Has, has it been fruitful in introducing that as an important consideration there in terms of formulating theory? Yeah, I'm not not far as I can tell. Yeah.
I'm kind of wondering what your thoughts on the state of sort of theoretical development uh, within the I field are in general. You know, I, uh, I thought we were doing, I thought we were doing better yeah. in the 80s and 90s. I think in the 2000s, we've, we've had a, a sort of a, a, dim, a diminution of yeah. the theoretical work. Of Any thoughts on, as to why this has sort of declined? Because it, there was a real blossoming in the early 90s there. Yeah. Um, that yeah. seemed to have been curtailed for whatever reason. I, I don't know if you have any notion as to I, I, why I don't know. I puzzle over it sometimes. Uh, I don't know why. It, I don't know why we've shifted from theory yeah. uh, driven work to sort of problem, okay. practical problem oriented work. Right. I, I don't know what made that shift happen. To, uh, yeah. I can speculate, and a lot yeah. of people do, but uh, <laughs> I, I really don't know. And um, anything, anything going to bring us out of that? Uh, this seems to be a sort of a malaise or a funk. That's, it, uh, it, it's it's circular. I, I think whoever's the editor of the journal has a lot to do with it. Oh, okay. But who gets selected as editor of the journal? Partly reflects uh, yeah. what's um, going on in the business okay. out there. So, all right. Yeah. You know, if we were to come up with a, uh, if the next editor of criminology, for example, were uh, someone who uh, thought that uh, theory was important to the development of the discipline, okay, and insisted that authors uh, frame their work uh, within a theoretical uh, okay agenda. Then I I think you'd begin to see some some shift there, but yeah. we just had uh, uh, we've lost that. Okay. And, uh, uh, there were two two editors in a row who were pretty theoretic oriented. Uh, I and Bob Bursick. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, but since then, uh, we haven't had that orientation. No. And now now Wayne is a, a wonderful scholar. Yeah. And uh, but Wayne is uh, is more of a methodologist okay. th than he is a, right. a theorist, and uh, his the thing that's really important to him mm -hmm. is get it right methodologically, okay. right. and uh, with a lesser concern with the the uh, what what is the point of the work in the first place. Okay. Uh, although I was really pleased with the statement that he and all of his uh, uh, associate editors made about what you need to do to get yeah. published. Did you see that? Yeah, I saw that. And uh, the, the idea that not all gaps need to be filled <laughs> yeah. was pretty good. He's good with turning a phrase. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty good. But yeah. the, the bottom line is uh, he's more interested in whether it's, whether it's right methodologically than whether it's useful okay. in a theoretical framework. So we're not going to see much uh, change. Uh, okay. We're going to see more rigorous methods applied to yeah. uh, I'm kind of, it, special issues. Can you give us a little insight into to what's driving your uh, most recent round of work here? It's it's taking on, it, from the outside looking in, uh, a decidedly uh, international comparative cast so I'm interested to hear your thoughts in terms of how theory operates in these different contexts, as well as your testing of a variety of different theories as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, give us some uh, feedback on, in terms of what's what's driving a lot of that. What are you finding? In okay. Uh, well, um, at first, uh, if you believe in general theory, then you have to believe that you have to test theoretical notions yeah. in a lot of different contexts. Yes, okay. Because if it's general, it's got to yeah. rise above uh, cultural That's limitations and so on and so forth. That's right. Yeah. So uh, the necessity and importance of uh, uh, cross-cultural, cross-site, cross-all kinds of situations uh, is just absolutely essential. Um, so, uh, but then getting into it, is uh, is not easy, and uh, and truthfully, the reason I got into it actually was uh, practical reasons. Okay. When I came to NC State, of course, I had a 
an endowed professorship, which yeah. provides some research money. It wasn't that much research money. And uh, the economy fell apart during the process, and for two or three of the ten years I was yeah. an endowed professor, there was no endowment. So uh, it wasn't much money to work with. Yeah. Uh, so um, I um, was looking for a way to uh, uh, do things on the cheap. <laughs> and um, uh, luckily, I had a couple of students who were from uh, uh, former Soviet republics. All right. First, I uh, had a, a Russian woman who ended up uh, here. Yeah. Uh, and then later on, I had a, a woman from the Ukraine. And uh, the the Russian woman. Oh, uh, of course, you know her name for literature name, uh, Olena Bochkovar. Yeah. Her publication name is uh, Katerina. Okay. But Boch uh, Kancha is her the name she goes by uh, among people who interact with her all the time. But anyway, she uh, was here because her husband came to study mathematics, and she had a master's degree from some uh, Eastern University. And nobody knew how to evaluate her transcript. Yeah. So she was told that if she could uh, uh, talk her way into a graduate seminar, and she did well, and the teacher in that seminar was willing to sponsor her, yeah, then she could be admitted to the department program PhD. So she was interested in theory, so she came and talked to me about it, and I said, "Sure, come on." And uh, so she came into the seminar and turned out to be uh, not the best student in the class, but certainly a very good one. Yeah. And she was working at a handicap because she was English was her second language. Yeah. And the theory literature, of course, is demanding and yeah and difficult anyway. But but she did very well. Yeah. And uh, so I got to know her and some of the things she was capable of and interested in. Yeah. And then I found out that every summer she would uh, go home and visit. Her family in Russia. Yeah. And so one summer she was, one spring she was getting cracked to do that. And I said, well, what do you, what do you do uh, after the first couple of weeks after you've <laughs> hugged and kissed her? Yeah. You know, and she caught up. What do yeah. You, what do you do the rest of the summer? She said, oh, not much. So I just sort of read and this and the other. And I said, well, why don't you do something useful? Why don't you do a <laughs> survey? Yeah. And she said, well, um, sure, I, how do we do it? Okay. And uh, so we put our heads together and worked up a survey that was she was supposed to conduct in uh, this uh, city where, where she lived. Yeah. And uh, it turned out to be sort of a disaster um, because everything went wrong. Yeah. Um, for example, we developed the survey instruments and uh, got them all printed up here and shipped them yeah. to this address in Russia. And they never arrived. And she went and she, she tried to take her down. thing in the yeah. summer and comes back here in August and these things finally come back and return mail in November. <laughs> wow. Where were they in the meantime? Yeah. God, God only knows. Anyway, of course, she's there to do the survey, and she doesn't have any. She has one copy of the survey instrument. Oh, wow. And so she doesn't have the facilities to re reproduce it or anything. Like so she goes and does these interviews, and then she. Uh, in and, then, and then she runs back home and. Uh, transcribes it onto something else, all right. and she erases all this, and she goes and does the next interview. Wow. Very adaptable. That's diligent. A, a very yeah. adaptable woman. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they were having a big election at the time she was there, and they were just getting used to democracy, and so they had a yeah. million, million candidates. Exaggeration, yeah. lots yeah. of candidates. All right. And they were all going door to door campaigning. And um, a large proportion of the Russian people live in these apartments and yeah. apartment houses. Yeah. And so 
uh, people got to where they just wouldn't wouldn't come to the door <laughs> because they didn't want to hear some Jake Lake uh, yeah. politicians. So, yeah. And so she's doing door to door surveys. So she's knocking the doors. Nobody's coming to the door. You know, all all these things happened. Uh -huh. Anyway, uh, ended up without a random sample. Ended up uh -huh. all kinds of things. But she gets back. She still has. 380 some interviews okay. with uh, Russians. Uh, they are not randomly sample Russians, but yeah. they're Russians. Okay. And so yeah, uh, we uh, we actually analyze it and send it off. We actually get three or four pubs out of this. And yeah. So so then we vow we're going to go back and do it right, yeah. and better. Okay. So next time we uh, we. Um, Find a professional survey organization All right. in Russia yeah. that uh, has people who were trained in the United States at NORC and other places. Oh. They run these survey okay. organizations yeah. in Russia. But because they don't have much business in Russia, unlike here, where yeah. you've got businesses and philanthropic organizations, all kinds of people always commissioning surveys yeah. in Russia they don't have much of that. So these survey organizations are desperate for business. Yeah. And we we find this out and of course yeah. we find out that we can do we can do uh, more with less uh, interview yeah. uh, the equivalent interview in the United States costs about two hundred dollars. You can do it for six bucks in Russia. <laughs> okay. Wow. So yeah. I said Wow, here's the chance to get some cross cultural data yeah. that I can actually afford. Okay. And so we did the one in Russia. Yeah. And then uh, I had this Ukrainian student that comes yeah. along. So we do one in Ukraine. Then we do a in comparative Greece. one in Greece and yeah. Russia and Ukraine. Yeah. And then we've done one in uh, uh, rural Ukraine, urban Ukraine, and okay. Bangladesh, All right. urban Bangladesh. And now John Brower, the, the fellow over at the University of Nebraska, we're also cooking up a longitudinal survey to be done okay. in Bangladesh. And then um, this fellow that I met at Sam Houston State, yeah. we're going to do going Turkey. To Turkey and, All right. Um, uh, lots of places that we, we were pretty far into working one up for Armenia. Okay. But... Um, uh, that one kind of uh, turned out to be uh, too expensive, so we couldn't do that one. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we've done enough of them now that we think we've got the technology of how to do it. Now, is, is this challenging some of the, the suppositions of conventional criminology? Or are you finding things that... Uh, uh, well, we're finding some things that um, uh, are part of the body of so-called knowledge here okay. have been confirmed. Okay. Uh, so that's reassuring. It's good to know. Yeah. Uh, we get uh, these uh, age crime relationships. We get uh, the uh, gender gap. Gender again. stuff like that. Okay. Uh, although the gender gap is not as stable as the age. Oh, that's age interesting. One. Pure effects. Uh, same okay. Thing. Uh, religiosity effects. Uh, all yeah. these. But other things we find um, uh, are quite problematic things okay. that people thought were, um, were well established, uh, don't hold up yeah. in these places. Uh, we did what I think is the, the, the best test yet of uh, social learning theory, mm. uh, which actually attempts to measure the reinforcement process. Okay. Uh, you know, yeah. Social learning theory, uh, the way Akers and his followers do it is they say there's a reinforcement process and it produces these outcomes but we can't worry with the reinforcement process we'll look at the outcomes and we will simply assume okay. that they are All right. produced by the reinforcement process so you're getting and the... those so so we say wait a minute you can't do that yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, because if you do that then uh, you can sort of create a, a, a uh, Tautology. Okay. So uh, we we thought that we ought to be able to actually show that there was a okay. reinforcement process here, and and, uh, and we did and, and confirmed it. And that paper is in the current issue of Social Forces. Okay. Which uh, yeah. I'm, I think is just just a, just a dynamite, wonderful paper. 
not because it reveals new things, yeah. but because it tests is a very powerful test yeah. of uh, of something that there must be in the literature four or five hundred mm. studies all supposed to document yeah. this, yeah. but they don't, okay. and, and uh, actually we do, and so it uh, is, we're, we're really proud of it, really, uh, right. yeah. and we, we were able to do it cheaply, <laughs> <laughs> because we were able to do the survey in, six bucks, in, uh, yeah, six bucks in Russia, this is 48 bucks an interview in Greece, so, oh, yeah. and in Ukraine it's about uh, seven or eight bucks, and Bangladesh is about eight bucks an interview, so yeah. anyway, yeah. but it doesn't take much money, and um, that's, I mean, that's the yeah. marvelous thing to me, and that's sort of the pitch I was making when I went over to Sam Houston State. Yeah. <laughs> you, with a little bit of money, you yeah. can actually get interesting data. Yeah. Good data, and so um, out of all the kids over there, only one of them bit on this yeah. kid from Turkey. So, <laughs> <laughs> but you've you've been working off a lot lately with a cadre of, of young scholars, so you may have given some thought to this question that I'm about to pose here. Um, what kinds of advice would you give to scholars who want to succeed in this business, um, the next the upcoming cohorts? What kinds of things would would you suggest to them that? Well. Um, I would uh, I would suggest doing what I did for, for, for one thing. Yeah. It's, I don't think that's a, a general model for uh, for success. In and terms of just the antagonistic tone and. Or yeah, yeah. I I. Um, that this is I've been theory. far too I've been too far too sharp, in uh, most of my uh, correspondence and so on and so forth. Yeah. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't recommend that. But yeah. there, there are, uh, I, I say, go somewhere where you work with people who are, who are doing scholarship every day. Okay. Because being told that you should do it is not the same <laughs> as watching somebody do it and participating okay. in doing it. Yeah. So the graduate school you choose uh, ought to be on the basis of are there active successful scholars okay. there who yeah. are contributing to the literature uh, because that's how you learn to do these things is by working with people who are doing them. Yeah. Can't learn it out of a textbook yeah. or anything like that. Yeah. Number two, uh, I'd say go to a grad school where you can learn uh, the, the best uh, and uh, uh, leading edge methodological techniques. Okay. Even if you don't use them, you need to know about them uh, because there's a fetish in our business that uh, sort of says y you uh, you have to use the fanciest, newest, fetish okay. approach. Yeah. Otherwise, you can't get published. And yeah. uh, uh, I've I've always found that it doesn't make a nickel's worth of difference. Uh, you you can. You can do a simple look at the data, yeah, and then you turn around and do it four really sophisticated ways, yeah, and you end up with the same with the same conclusion. All right, yeah. although the numbers might yeah. be different, but the same overall conclusion. Yeah. So I don't think that it's near as important as uh, Wayne does. Okay. But uh, I also pretty sure that you can't get polished unless you do those <laughs> things. Jesus. Okay. So, yeah. So so I would say. And no matter how good your ideas are, nobody cares about ideas if you don't have some data to back them up. Okay. And the data has to be packaged in the format of uh, sophisticated methodology. So uh, an essential to success is okay. the, the, those, those methods. Um, and third, I would say uh, one needs to get uh, in your training, exposed to as many ideas as possible. Okay. Because in your career, uh, the more ideas you have to work with in the back of your mind, yeah. the more things you're going to have questions about. And when you see new things, uh, it'll suggest 
research projects that okay. suggest, suggest things that need to be investigated and so on. Uh, so a good, uh, a good education exposure to theories and a good education exposure to the yeah. empirical literature, uh, at least the empirical literature that contains some something that to, might be applicable okay. beyond that particular situation. Okay. Uh, and with those kinds of things and uh, a motivation and hard work, yeah. um, what else do you need? Okay. Uh, now, crim criminology is now it's got its own sort of fiefdom at this point. You've always been in sociology departments. Uh, is there a difference between those in terms of allowing maximum at access to these the wider palette of ideas? Well, it's been it's been difficult to have a foot in each camp. Yeah. For me, because yeah. cause sociologists uh, uh, have been trying to get rid of criminology for a long time. Yeah. And all the major departments of sociology in the country have sort of systematically pushed out yeah. uh, criminology. So by now, there are just a handful of departments left that have a substantial presence in criminology. Yeah. Um, so it's hard to justify yourself yeah. as a sociologist. Yeah. Um, but if you're too if you're too firmly planted in sociology, it's also difficult to justify yourself to criminology. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So you you have to go back and forth like that. Okay. Uh, as an illustration, I'm right now working with uh, uh, a young woman in my department, a, a new faculty member we hired last fall. Mm -hmm. She's a methodologist, yeah. statistician. Okay. And uh, for, uh, got her degree from. Uh, one of those uh, uh, Dutch universities where okay. they specialize in medicine. Anyway, um, uh, what we're working on is uh, the causes and consequences of segregation. There's absolutely nothing to do with criminality. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, one of my uh, top grad students right now is working on a theory having to do with sex ratios and status of women. Mm. No, also, then, yeah, all right. And uh, uh, but these are interesting yeah, okay. theoretical questions, okay. and uh, yeah. there happens to be some really good accessible data that uh, I happen to find out about and have developed and so on and so forth. Huh. And uh, so, uh, but this young a woman who's doing the sex ratio study, um, she's nervous because yeah. she's interested in criminology, and she says. What's going to happen to me when I get on the job market? <laughs> yeah. And my dissertation topic has nothing to do with criminology. Yeah. And I said, well, that is that is a risk you're going to have yeah. to take because you're sort of going to have to go to a, a, a sociology department. Yeah. And that's going to limit your okay. things. But when you get into a sociology department, you're also going to encounter uh, some problem with uh, feminist scholars. Who um, don't uh, who who don't think that uh, structural issues like sex ratio matter? Okay. Because they're 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 concerned with uh, discrimination and oppression and okay. all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And uh, the sex ratio theory that uh, my students working with is uh, is a structural argument okay. about the status of women. Yeah. Uh, it ha it's a very interesting one and. One that uh, uh, we think uh, we can hook up a pretty good, pretty good test on. Yeah. So uh, that's the that's the problem when you're when you're straddling. Yeah, sort of the identity issues is it, absolutely, and in, in your acceptance and your how do you justify yourself yeah. and so on and so forth. Um, criminology is a little domain all by itself, but once you get into that little domain. You're sort of trapped there. Yeah. You can't. You can't escape. Yeah. Well, you you can if you're if you're really uh, incredible like uh, Rob Sampson. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's a guy who was trained in criminal. Sure. Yeah. And uh, uh, has become now yeah. a very famous sociologist. Sure. Um, yeah. 
but he he did that by sort of putting aside the label yeah. and identity as a criminologist yeah. and uh, developing these yeah. issues within a sociological framework. Right. But but that's the problem. Uh, uh, I, I wouldn't advise my grad students to become too deeply okay. engrossed in criminology because okay. they're going to be well, are going to be discriminated against, okay. basically, yeah. at most universities because criminology doesn't have the status and prestige that uh, other disciplines have. Okay. Uh, yeah. Now, sociology for a long time was the, the shit department. Yeah. You had economics and political science and yeah. and all this. And yeah. They're all up here and there's sociology down there. <laughs> okay. But now sociology has uh, a, a uh, yeah. further down the the slope. Okay. And now it's criminology, so all that, yeah. all that bad stuff can flow down to them. It's the, uh, them okay. and edu schools of education. That's the only <laughs> sociology outranks only criminology <laughs> and schools of education. They don't outrank any other discipline. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this has been a really fruitful and wide-ranging discussion here in terms of just getting an account of you and your your thoughts on the state of the science and some of the things that you, you've managed to contribute uh, in its development and theory. And, uh, I'm just wondering at, at this point uh, if there's anything that you feel that we may have overlooked or anything you'd like to contribute that you think uh, would be important and worth worth mentioning and preserving here at account of. Well, I can't think of anything huh. right now. I'll probably think of 12. <laughs> That's kind of the thing after, yeah. after we shut the tape off. It's like a right. right. situation where we have. Well, that would have been really interesting to talk about. But uh, I, I really appreciate uh, your time and your, your contribution to the. the well, I'm glad you came there. over, and, uh, yeah. especially since you're making a pretty, pretty substantial personal sacrifice yeah. to finish out this project. Yeah. I appreciate, appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, that was just that's sort of that. Uh, what about you? Anything? <laughs>